Good morning to you. <laughs> Please stand and let's begin our worship service this morning. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. to be here this morning to give you our worship, our adulation, and expressions of our love and praise to you, Father. Thank you for a place to come on Sunday morning. Thank you for this church building and this church campus. 
Thank you for our friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for those who are visiting with us for the first, second, or third time even. We ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit would direct this worship service for your glory and your purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, it's good to see everybody here this morning. Do we have any first-time visitors here? Anybody? All right. Could you uh, tell us who you are? Uh, my name's Kathy. Kathy Nace. And um, this is my friend. <laughs> and uh, she's the one that, you know, brought me to church this morning. And, uh, well, Kathy, we're glad to have you here. Let's give Kathy a round of applause. <laughs> Any other first-time visitors here? It's not his first time. Second time, third time. About his hundredth time, I think, but he's been gone for a few years. <laughs> is that who I think it is? The man whose picture is on that wall. That's right. <laughs> his oh. name is Gator, and I cannot think of his real name, but his nickname is Gator, and we just love him to pieces. Let's give Gator a hand. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? I don't want to exclude anybody. Can you use your microphone and tell us? My name is Irene, but they call me Lola as a grandma. That means grandma in my country, Philippines. So, thank you. Also, as most, if not all of you know, I'm not pastor of this church. I am one of the elders. Our pastor, John, is away on a well-needed R&R vacation. So I will be speaking this Sunday. Brother Jim will be speaking next Sunday. And we believe that Pastor John will follow on the next Sunday, which will be July 26th. Okay. Well, Jonathan and Renee, I am glad to have you here. Would you like for me to concoct a story for you? Yes? Okay, I have to make up one. <laughs> there was a safari, and the safari leader said, walk down the center of the road, and you'll have no problem. You follow me. But there was a little boy and a little girl, and they didn't want to do just what they were told. They wanted to see how far they could get away from doing what they were told. So they walked down the sides of the road in darkest Africa. That's not good. But the person at the back happened to see a baboon viper along the side of the road. And he picked up the little boy just in time before the viper could strike. And then both the boy and the girl walked down the center of the road. <laughs> Moral of this story is sometimes we want to do things our way, but God has his way. And sometimes we have to do what we are told. That's not always easy, but sometimes we do. So, put your trust in your parents. Put your trust in your elders. And by elders, I don't just mean that position, but those Christian people in the church who are looking after you, who are praying for you, and who love you. And you'll be most likely walking in God's will. Amen. 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 Amen.
Let's see a show of hands this morning. How many sometimes like to sing one of the old favorites? <laughs> All right, this morning we're going to sing the old yeah. rugged cross. Starting off this message, I'd like to take you back just a few years, a time to when you were smaller, back to an earlier time in your life, back to your childhood. Now, for most of you, that was at least 25 years ago. <laughs> Do you remember when you were about 10 years old? Do you remember the boy? or the girl who seemingly had it all together. They were their own boss. 
Nobody told them what to do. And I learned at a very young age that if I wanted to be cool or be with it, nobody was going to tell me what to do. And I carried this attitude with me into my early adult life. Things that we pick up as children seem to just stick there even though we don't see them. In the golden age of Hollywood filmmaking, Edward G. Robinson famously said, now do it my way, see? <laughs> he was a boss. It was his way or the highway. And subconsciously, I incorporated this into who I was. In 1969, a French song became a hit when it was re-recorded by Frank Sinatra. Old Blue Eyes sang, I did it my way. This is one of Frank Sinatra's signature songs until his death in 1998. He did it his way. But then in December of 1970, someone else entered my life and wanted to be on the throne of my life. Someone actually wanted me to do things his way. And he had things for me to do. And he wanted to direct me to do those things. When we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we must relearn some things that we have held to be true perhaps for many years. We now have to learn to do it God's way, His way. God shows us the how in the Holy Scriptures, and God has not left us alone to walk in the darkness of life. So who might actually help us today? Who is actually with us 24-7. John chapter 16, verses 12 and 13 tell us, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Jesus is telling us that God's Holy Spirit is to lead us, to direct us into all truth truth. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 25 tells us, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. But just how practical is the Holy Spirit's leading? Imagine that I am stopped at a red light. A beggar asks me, could could you help me get a little bit of food? I need a little bit of money. <laughs> what would your response be? Of course, we know that all beggars are just going to take our money. They will buy a bottle or cigarettes or drugs with the money. Or perhaps they have issues with gambling. But what do we really know? Have we walked in this particular beggar's shoes? How are you certain that this particular beggar is not going to spend that money for food for her or his family? How do you know? It's very easy to just judge the beggar. But how does one judge a beggar? We judge the beggar by what we see. We cannot judge the beggar very well because if we are honest with ourselves, we really don't know, do we? Rarely do we know so much about a beggar as his or her name. Let me read from Matthew chapter 25, verses 41 through 46. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. 
I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. I believe that there are some who refuse to give anything to any beggar. They should go out and get a job. I'm not going to give them any of my money. I don't care what anybody says. But does anybody include the Holy Spirit? Do we care what the Holy Spirit tells us? Clearly from Matthew chapter 5, there are some whom God may indeed want us to give to. How do we know which beggar, if any, to give to? How do we know which beggar, if any, to say no to? For me, the answer is the Holy Spirit. If I feel the leading, if I feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit, I give. If I do not feel the leading of the Holy Spirit, I don't give. But if anything, I am consistent with whether I give or not. But not consistent in my ability to judge the beggar. Consistent in that the Holy Spirit's leading is more important than my human wisdom. Another area where the leading of the Holy Spirit is frequently trumped is in the area of outreach and evangelism. I had done some door-to-door -door evangelism in the 1980s. I asked a pastor friend of mine, have you ever done any door-to-door -door evangelism? And he told me, no, the yield is too low. The yield is too low? Doesn't it say in Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38, then he, meaning Jesus, said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And in 1 Corinthians 3, reading verses 5 through 7, what after all is Apollos? What is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned to each his task, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Because it is God who makes things grow, because it is God's harvest, who are we to decide whether or not we will do any particular type of outreach? Are we to use our human wisdom to try and estimate what God is going to do with a particular outreach? Should we then presume to judge by our expectation of God's performance? whether or not we will participate in a particular outreach function or not. But isn't this frequently what we do? It is as if we hold our Heavenly Father to our own protocol. And if we do go out, how many must come to salvation in Jesus Christ in order for us to determine that it was worth our time going out? Or to put it a different way, how much harvest must God show me before I am willing to do what he has commanded me to do? How then should we determine whether to be involved in any particular outreach venture? Again, it is the Holy Spirit, isn't it? 
The Holy Spirit's leading. If I feel that the Holy Spirit is leading me into any particular outreach ministry, my answer is yes. Yes to God. How can my response be anything but yes? But sometimes don't I tell God no. Even when I feel the leading of the Holy Spirit is to say yes. The very fiber of our being is telling us that the answer that God would require is yes. Why would we then tell God no? I suspect that Frequently we tell God no because of human wisdom. Human wisdom frequently trumps the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives. What God would require then must pass some kind of test of what we want. If it does not, we frequently put God a distant second. We tell him no. To outreach this week, we told him no. To outreach last week, in fact, individually, we may have been telling God no to outreach for the last two years or even longer. Regardless of the Holy Spirit's leading, our answer to God is still no. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Another area where we commonly ignore the Holy Spirit's leading is in the area of service. When I joined Heritage Bible Church, in the worship bulletin there was usually something about, and this Saturday there's going to be a work day for the entire church. <laughs> the purpose of this work day was not only that we could get the sanctuary cleaned, it was more than cutting the grass or pulling the weeds. Workdays also fostered fellowship and interaction among those who came together to work for the Lord. Now, I'm not recommending the return of workdays. Let me, let me say that again. <laughs> I am not recommending the return of workdays to Heritage Bible Church. But looking back, were there times when the Holy Spirit told us to come out and help? And we didn't. Has the Holy Spirit ever prompted us to come to the church and do something to take care of God's church? To take care of this campus that we've been so graciously given access to? Have we ever told God's Holy Spirit no because of blank? And we can fill in the blank with whatever human wisdom tells us to fill it in with. Again, Human wisdom trumps the leading of the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? Personally, I am so very thankful that a significant number of people in this congregation do what God's Holy Spirit leads them to do in the area of service. I'm so thankful for people who will tell God, yes. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 26, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go down the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. So he started out? And we know what happened, don't we? Philip met and spoke with a eunuch who was traveling on that same road. The eunuch was reading from the book of Acts, chapter 8 and verses 32 and 33. Then the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Notice that though it was on a Sabbath, Philip just got up and went as he was told. God's Holy Spirit spoke and Philip said, yes. Human wisdom did not enter into Philip's picture. The fact that this particular road from Jerusalem to Gaza was not the main road, the fact that it was frequented by thieves and bandits and 
undesirables was not a functioning concern for Philip. Human wisdom and human fear did not enter into Philip's mind as far as keeping him from doing what the Holy Spirit was telling him to do. If God told us to help with the ministry of the church on a particular day, what would we say to God? I can't do it today. <laughs> I've got the beer and the chips ready. I'm not going to miss the Packers game for anybody. <laughs> I can't do it today. Not on that day. No, I meet with the girls for an early dinner. So that day is out of the question. Maybe some other time. Don't we frequently have our excuses for God? And by the time we get around to doing what God is asking of us, our Ethiopian is gone. The opportunity is gone. We could have told someone the good news, but we were too busy doing life our way. I personally know of a man, a godly man. Not infrequently, one could see him smile as he did the things that God's Holy Spirit told him to do. Human wisdom was never a real consideration when it came to following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Not for this man. No. In his life, the Holy Spirit always came out on top. There was one time in particular that the Holy Spirit asked this man to do something. The man did not actually say no. But there was a part of him that did not relish what the Holy Spirit was leading him into. The man prayed to God the Father and asked, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus was both God and man. The human aspect did not really want to suffer the horrible death of a cross. And yet Jesus Christ, being God the Son, was not going to tell the Holy Spirit, no. Jesus knew that God, the Holy Spirit, was only leading him to do the will of God the Father. Human wisdom versus the leading of the Holy Spirit and we know what happened, don't we? Jesus followed the leading of God's Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ died that horrible death on a cross. He suffered much pain. He suffered mental anguish while he was being tortured. It was as if he didn't have any human or personal rights at all. Jesus Christ made a choice. Are you not glad today because of what Jesus did on the cross for you? I certainly am. Because of Jesus' blood on the cross, I have been promised an eternity in heaven. All good things are now possible because Jesus said no to his humanity and because he said yes to God. Let me read from Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. Verse 10 is unusually significant. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So when you feel the leading of God's Holy Spirit, be ready to tell him, yes. It may be to give a few dollars to a beggar, it may be to help in the ministry or the maintenance of the church building and or this church campus. It may be to be involved in outreach and evangelism. It may be to, well again, you can fill in the blank. God is not going to ask you to do something that you cannot do. I know this. I know something that will happen someday. Jesus Christ is going to tell me to go to his right. 
I'm not going to procrastinate. I don't have to go and pray about it. I'm not going to have a discussion with my brothers and sisters as to whether I'm going to go to his right. I'm just going to say, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. For by then, I will be completely done with human wisdom. Frank Sinatra sang, Now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. For what, what has, what has a man got? What is a man? If not himself, then he has not. To say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels, I did it my way. It's a great song. But for us who know Jesus as Savior and Lord, for us who want to be counted among the righteous, it's only a song. We must do it God's way. Jesus is indeed the way, the only way. At some point in our life, we must choose God. God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son and with the leading of God's Holy Spirit, we must relearn to do it God's way. This morning I would like for us to close our eyes in silent prayer for about two or three minutes. I would like for everyone who has trusted Jesus Christ as Savior to silently pray for the salvation of anyone here who has not made that decision to know salvation God's way. And now with our eyes closed, and no peeping. If you want to know Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning, if you are tired of doing it the world's way, and you want to invest in God's way, raise your hand and somebody will come to you. It will only take two minutes. If you want to choose God's way instead of your own way, and you have not made that decision previously, raise your hand. I want to thank those workers in this church who have agreed to be a part of this altar call. That if anyone had raised their hand they were ready, willing, and able to tell them the good news about Jesus Christ and to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Let's close in prayer now. Father in heaven, we again thank you for this service. All glory and honor and praise are due to you, Father, for inspiring, empowering, and directing every aspect of this worship service. Father, a special prayer for Richard McGuire this morning. We pray that you would comfort him, ease his pain, and be with him, close to him, and let him and Sonia know that we are praying for them. Send us now on our way, Father, after this closing song, to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song this morning. Violin, does he love you? You bet. And Do you I think love he loves him. me? Oh, yes. Let's sing the song. <laughs> oh, I should do this, shouldn't I? Okay. We're so formal here, can't you, Tam? <laughs> But just start the song, we know the song.
are dismissed.